Thank you. I'm one of the ones who stumbled in here. That's me. Um, interactive light. I got my uh, socials up here because I have to go back to Austin too quick this year. And so if we want to have a discussion, it'd be great. We can just do it on Twitter, back and forth, on the plane home. Um, I love Toronto. It's my home again, away from home. And, um, well, if you guys have seen me speak in the past or seen one of my presentations, I'm always talking about, like, the future patterns of technology and a lot of really stuff that's up here. But some people have correctly noticed an undercurrent uh, in my work, and this I have an obsession with turning on and off lights. <laughs> Essentially, most of what I do intersects there. Um, so I thought I would like to go through some of these projects and some new ones as well that deal with this notion of interactive light. Um, not just interacting with lights, turning them on and off, but also um, some of the ways that I actually make this stuff work in my personal projects and some of the ways that I think it's going to impact us as designers going forward, and there's kind of a coming wave that we'll, we'll conclude on at the, at the end. Um, yeah, it's just all turning on and off lights. <laughs> Where do I get the light from? Um, fire is one of the places I like to get light from. This is the Fireman. I, it's been out there for a while now, and it sounds like a theremin. And basically, using a connect, you can interact with fire. It's one form of interactive light. It's the only fire I'm going to show today, so don't worry. I'm not actually a pyromaniac. As it turns out, uh, <laughs> I just like uh, interacting with light. Uh, RGB LEDs are really fun, really easy to work with, and we'll go over some ways to work with those and do some fun things. Then there's also infrared light, which is really fascinating, and I use it a lot in two forms. Uh, one, just simple um, infrared LEDs, and two, um, this guy here, or all of its different cousins that can do depth sensing, and they tend to use uh, infrared as well. Projectors, um, I got my first projector uh, that I bought in 2005, it's a Hitachi Ultra Short Throw projector. I still use it occasionally. It was one of the best investments I ever made, almost as good as when I bought my first Sony PC in 1998. I financed that sucker at uh, Best Buy instead of buying a new car in college. And um, Ultra Short Throw projectors are some of my favorite kinds of projectors. Why? Because they have this awesome capability. They have these hyper... Uh, lenses on them, which mean that from about 12 inches of height, I can cover this whole five-foot table in light. And if I back it up four feet from a, a wall, I can cover a 20-foot wall. Ultra-short throw projectors tend to be a little more expensive, and they have some of their own curiosities, but they're really fascinating to work with as well. So I thought maybe I should go in like the science of light and stuff, but, you know, catch me later. It's really fascinating stuff. It gets down to like all kinds of levels, but really all you need to know is a very surface level <laughs> about light. I think it's more important to think about the right. Yeah, okay. Without when it's dark in a room, you have a certain kind of aesthetic, but you're not reading a lot of colors. I don't mean it that way. I actually mean it in a different kind of uh, uh, almost richer way. When light hits an object, it is influenced by that object, right? So when you have an iPad and you set it on the table, all the colors that come off of that iPad are pure from the screen because it's opaque behind there. But when you have light projecting on a table, it picks up everything about that table. The colors that the light hit combine with the, the, the photons changes and different colors come back. And so it creates its own kind of very different sort of aesthetics. It's really live. And when you match that with the, the notion that for eons, our eyes have basically evolved to be creatures that take in light it means that we actually react to light in our environment a lot differently when it's blended like this than we do when it's like 
shooting out of us out of a screen. It's really interesting. In terms of information, light has this capability. Yeah, it's particle and waves. It actually can carry information. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it also is this ability to take any surface and place information on it for you to collect. And that's really fascinating because you don't have to bring your phone out of your pocket to regard it. And then in terms of magic, lots of definitions of magic get thrown around out there. But, you know, usually it's like, you know, uh, technology you can't understand or something that's uh, sub sufficiently invisible. The invisible part that's, is what's interesting to me. Um, infrared light is not visible to the eye. And so when it's carrying information to something, a reaction can happen. It's quite magical because you're not exactly sure what made it happen. It's a sleight of hand trick. Um, so let me start there. These are the social lamps. And... Yeah, they change colors, um, but what I w wanted to do was, like, I really wanted to use infrared light in this kind of way where it approximates the human gaze, which is one of the amazing properties of infrared light. Uh, you can't see it, but also it can't, like, go through things. It's not like radio waves. It's not like x-rays. Um, when it runs into something, it stops, similar to the way of the human gaze. Also, infrared LEDs have this ability to f have different focuses. So you can have it blast a whole room or you can have it focused down to a narrow cone. And if you get a cone that's close, like 20 degrees, close to what the human gaze is, suddenly it has this, picks up this latent natural physical property of approximating the human gaze. Wherever the LED light is pointing would be where you could see. And I said, I wanna play with that in order to change the way we turn on and off lights. And so, I had to do a lot of this, okay? Um, what I decided to do is let me create a source of infrared light, and that's really easy to do. All you need is an infrared LED, a battery, and then you're done. <laughs> or at least you think you're done because it turns out that that's just like sunlight and it's really not very useful to you just to blast infrared light everywhere. Um, luckily, they've been working on this problem for a long, long time, and you can find these guys. Um, this is a TSOP 38. They make them in 48s and 58s. And what it is is it's a little uh, diode that when the infrared hits it, um, it has extra circuitry in there to screen, basically to screen out infrared unless it's interleaved at 38 hertz. What that means is pulsing on and off 38,000 times a, a second. The sun doesn't do that. The sun is a blasting at full. So essentially, these screen out sunlight. Um, they screen out <clears throat> infrared that's coming off of your you know, fluorescent tubes. And that makes them very useful. <clears throat> and so I said, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to blast infrared at 38 hertz, and then I'm going to read it at 38 hertz, and then I'm going to see how I can approximate the human gaze with that. So I needed a few more electronics to put this together. And these are some of my favorites, too. This is a SparkFun red stick. It's essentially an Arduino Uno. It's a little tiny computer that its interface is like little voltage pins. And it plugs in its form factor directly into a USB port, which is really fun because you can make a little enclosure super fast by just getting one of these iPad chargers that throws off quite a bit of uh, power, actually, 2.4 amps, and it's 5 volts, which the stick runs at 5 volts. And then you can get one of these guys, which is a, a Edison to socket adapter, and then you buy a $9 floor lamp from Ikea. You screw that into the light bulb fixture, you plug that in the light bulb fixture, and now you have a computerized lamp that you can program. And so now the lamp needs to do something, so I go get some Adafruit NeoPixels and read the Adafruit Uber guide for NeoPixels. You may have gathered something at this point. I'm not an electrical engineer. <laughs> Mark knows that, just by the way I've been saying a lot of this stuff wrong. I didn't know any of this stuff when I started this project. <clears throat> My starting point was, I want a different way to turn on and off lights. I want to make lights social. Basically, I wanted them to turn on and off based on how many people were looking at them. 
And that's where it started. And that's why I needed to approximate the human gaze. And then I was thinking, oh, I th think infrared can do this. And then I was like, how do I make the infrared work? And then I went to Google, and I found out. And then I went to Google, and I found out some circuits that I could put together simple enough. And then I went to Google and found out that yeah, I could control RGB LEDs. Important thing about RGB LEDs, though, don't go cheap. This is a rookie mistake, and I made this mistake several times. Uh, it turns out when you put a bunch of these uh, RGB LEDs, which can be controlled, and the reason they've been controlled is each little LED on this strip has its own little microprocessor, and it runs on a standard called WS2812. And you send a little byte stream down this thing, and you, you actually don't have to know what any of this stuff is. The Uber guy takes care of it, and, and, and they have libraries take care of it, too. But what, what I've learned recently is that um, it's real easy to put something together that looks like this with components in China. It's really hard to make them work well. Because when you line up that many circuits, it has to be balanced in the end, and it has to have certain considerations for capacitance. All kinds of things that won't happen at $9 on Amazon. <laughs> And I've wasted a lot of money buying these things for $9 on Amazon. They come straight from China. These also come from China, but two different factories. And one of them is just copying these. These are $25. And that's for 60 pixels on a one-meter strip. And so you can see there, you're paying about 50 cents a pixel. And if you're not, <clears throat> you're probably wasting your money. More importantly, you're wasting your time wondering, why isn't this strip lighting up? when it's not your fault at all, and when you're like a script kitty like me and you're just trying to file, follow someone's guide, it can cost you days, hours, and eventually you give up thinking you don't know anything. Luckily, I didn't give up. I went and bought a more expensive light strip from Adafruit, who I would recommend as a provider, and I get nothing from them. They're just very good at sourcing their, their strips, and everyone copies them. And the same code and the same circuit that I had hacked together started working instantly, just on the switch of the hardware side. And this is the mysterious thing for people who are programmers or designers when you get into the hardware world. There is no compiler error for you to key in on. And so you, but it's still the same troubleshooting of eliminating variables until you're like, oh, it's gotta be this strip. So don't cheap out on your strips, okay? <clears throat> so now I had a badge and I had something that could read it and the more badges I put down, I just pro programmed a little simple logic um, to light up the lights differently based on how many badges were in front of it. And this is me testing it on my back patio. And um, it's working pretty well. Here's what it's basically doing. So I'm using the 38 hertz pulse, which I got out of uh, Adafruit's little IR, receiving IR library. And I'm sending out a pulse. And it's a very short pulse. And it has to be a very short pulse because these T-stops actually are designed to screen out IR. So if you hit them with too long of a pulse, they actually decide it's noise and they just shut down and quit listening until they're getting no IR for a while. And so that pulse is about uh, 25 milliseconds. And then I'm shooting pulses over a period of time, about 200 milliseconds in total. So 25 microsecond pulse, uh, 200 milliseconds. And basically then you just can do some arithmetic. If you take the number of pulses that the lamp is seeing coming towards it, and you divide it by the number of pulses that are in a certain period, then you can approximate the number of badges or people facing the lamp. And then you can act on it. Here's the interesting thing I found out about the universe. Okay, It's a very rhythmic place out there. And it, you know, folds in on itself on ten dimensions, and it, we're all a lot closer together than we think we are on those ten dimensions. So when I originally did this project, I had it just going off like a clock. That's what made sense. And what I found was, no matter what I did, and it seemed impossible that this should happen because I'm just putting all the pulses would line up, <laughs> and like. 
If I was trying to get them to line up, I probably couldn't. I could probably couldn't put in the batteries at the same time fast enough. But when I just put in a battery, 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 <clears throat> and I was getting horrible results. And so what I did is I made a logarithmic pulse. So it actually goes, it like it speeds up as it goes, and then it starts over and resets. And for whatever reason is going on out there in the universe, this kind of fixed my data set immensely. Now the pulses didn't line up anymore. I don't know why, but every now and then you just have to like sit back and think metaphysically in order to get this stuff done. Or buy an oscilloscope <laughs> if, you're, if you know what you're doing. <laughs> when you don't, you, you can actually get farther on the metaphysical in this world. At 5 volts. Don't get metaphysical at 110 volts. <clears throat> <laughs> you need to know what you're doing before you attach things. And this was the result in the end, right? So I have this lamp that all it can do is count arithmetic, and I got people wearing badges, and the lamp lights up when they face it, and when they turn around, the lamp gets sad, and the other lamp gets happy. <laughs> so these are social lamps, and adding just a small amount of intelligence to the lamp completely changes how you have to turn on and off the, the lamp. It becomes a very curious thing. And I've wanted to extend this into all kinds of other projects like stages at a, like a music festival where the volume of the PA is controlled based on how many people are watching the artist, which would be super hard on the artist, but really awesome for the audience, right? Because <laughs> it's bad enough to be up there and there's no one out there, but then to have the volume turned down because nobody's, <laughs> nobody's interested, that's kind of like, ah. That's painful. But we would get better music out of it in the end. <clears throat> All right, let me move on to another way of using infrared light and RGB LEDs. That was the paint by RGB wall. We had it here last year. How many of you were here and got to play with it? Great. Let me tell you a little more of where this came from. Everything starts with a sketch when something like this. And this was the sketch that started the RGB wall. And you might notice something. There's no RGB wall in the sketch anywhere. In fact, there's a completely different concept altogether. Um, you may notice, though, the social lamps are in the sketch. <laughs> and there are these social cups that are also in the sketch, that were called NFC cups back then. And what that led to was, like, how could I light up these cups and I wanted to do it as expediently as possible, so I started buying these waterproof, um, IR-controlled little um, tea lights and just putting them on the bottom of cups. I was like, I like this effect. And then that led me to go, where can I find more of these tea lights and inexpensive? And China was the answer. AliExpress, it was amazing. It's also a quagmire that can be an disa absolute disaster. There's two things to know when sourcing from China. One is you'll never get it in August around the Chinese New Year because everyone goes home to celebrate the New Year at their like home village or their home city, and then they come back to the factories, and the factories close for five weeks, and you just can't get anything uh, from there. Second is you need to know somebody in China. This video comes from a coworker of mine at the time in Frog who was in the marketing department and I was so frustrated trying to negotiate with this guy in Shenzhen over the internet through AliExpress um, and I email us, can anyone from the Shanghai office like drive, fly, take a train over there? She goes over there, uh, Chinese national citizen talks to the guy for half an hour, sends me back this video, and says I can get 5,000 of these with three AAA batteries installed in them for a dollar each. <laughs> Shipped. <laughs> this is great, because up until that point, it had been $25,000. <laughs> and it wasn't going to be uh, anywhere near the U.S. in six months. But one person on the ground in China like changed that equation instantly. But then I got my head thinking. Um, the problem was I couldn't find a source for cups. And I was like, but I, got, I can get these 5,000 tea lights. <laughs> what can I do with 5,000 tea lights? And I, this was the next sketch that came out. And so you got to be open to changing course on things when they're not working out. 
you got to take the pivot. And uh, anyone who's in software or done a startup knows that this lesson goes way beyond interactive installations. You got to be able to take the pivot. Sometimes you got to go where your materials are taking you. Sometimes you have to go where the market is taking you. This is a case of materials. So we sketched this up and said, hey, let's do a giant remote controlled T light bright. Paint by RGB sounds so much better, but the names come at the end. And originally, we built it up for South by Southwest out of foam core and wood. It was a good pilot project. But I think more interesting is the reconstruction story. Because after South by Southwest, I had these buckets here because we had to take the batteries out. And um, anyone want to venture a guess how much uh, 15,000 AAA batteries weighs? <laughs> it's really heavy. It's good I have a, a Ford F-250 back in Texas because that's about what it takes. It's over a ton. And when I went to recycle them, um, no one would take them. <laughs> they wanted me to pay by the pound. It was going to cost me like $4,000 just to recycle these AAAs. And so I went into a Batteries and Plus store, which is just a little retail outlet. And I took the guy out to my truck. I said, look at these batteries. I can't find anyone to recycle them. He's like, yeah, it's 60 cents a pound or whatever. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, but I'll tell you what. This is the kind of battery buyer I am. <laughs> if you will recycle these for free, the next time I need to buy batteries, I'm coming to you. <laughs> and he looks at him and he's like, wow, this guy buys batteries by the ton. <laughs> and he says, yes, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and then I gave him all my batteries and I said, I gotta figure out a way to wire these things up so I never have to buy batteries again. <laughs> so karmically, I'm still paying for that. <laughs> I still, but anytime I need a battery, I buy it from the guy. It, it just, I, it has not paid off the way he thought it was going to. And so this is where you begin prototyping things. I was like, okay, I got a bunch of jumper pins and I bought my first bench power supply. Can you believe it took this long? Like all that time I was just working off little wall warts left over from phone chargers and stuff and I just snip them off and strip the wires. And uh, these things are great. Um, you can actually see how much amperage is being drawn. You can set current limits and you can set precise voltage, in this case 4.5 volts because um, these lights were originally run off of three AAA batteries and if you add that up that's 4.5 volts and I, they were made in China so I'm like I probably shouldn't push it to five because it'll probably just blow up uh, over time. It'll, let, let, it'll shorten their life. And um, the idea was how to wire all of this up. One of the main problems to solve was connecting. It turns out that they make these little pins out of um, stainless steel, essentially, um, or some sort of alloy that's designed not to rust and not to get into an electrolysis kind of a state, which makes them almost impossible to solder to. Because originally I was thinking, oh, this is solder. There's also three screws, and I could open the thing up but then it's open up, and it turns out the way the paint by RGB light wall works, if you take the cover off the back, it doesn't work as well because the way the infrared light bounces around. I'll go over that later. And so we started playing. First, I had aluminum foil here um, wrapped around uh, wooden dowels, thinking uh, that could work. Um, aluminum foil is a horrible conductor, right? <laughs> and I did some measurements. I was like, oh, that's not going to work. That's going to just start a fire is what that's going to do. We have to have a better thing. So I got some better uh, uh, wires that could carry the capacity and started jamming them in with wooden pegs. And you'll notice there that this, in the first efforts we made here, things were really loose. We, these Gel dots came in, we're like, oh, that's going to be a real pain. And then Canada to the rescue. I love Canada. I found, <laughs> for more reasons than just this, but this is one reason. I found a place in Vancouver who makes these. They're called Bear Woods. <laughs> like B-E-A-R, wood. Bear Wood Products. And not only will they make them, but you can 
give them a custom size. So I had them make me 15,000 of them that are exactly the same size as a AAA battery. And this solved the problem because now we could just jam some wires in there, jam the pegs in, and that was our cheap wiring system. Um, it turns out to be a very loose tolerance system, which is not bad because when something breaks down um, and everything's that open, it's really easy to locate the problem and to fix it, which meant we didn't have to design a lot of redundancy or really like worry about our materials. So then it just turned into a factory, okay? We made some jigs and channeled the inner Foxconn worker inside of ourselves and got to work. And um, each one of these is uh, an 18 light strip and we needed a lot of them. And so um, it took 80 hours with two people working to just put all these strips together. And then we needed a way to um, control the lights. So this is one of the amazing things about light. Uh, it can be a carrier wave for signals. And I'll, because we wanted to control TVs without getting off our, our ass, um, we began to develop ways with infrared to carry simple signals. And Adafruit has a great library for receiving and decoding IR signals. Essentially what happens is just like the social lamps, things are pulsing on and off in an interleaved 38 kilohertz. So they're really pulsing really fast, but you're going to do that for 20 milliseconds, then 50, then on. And basically you can decide that that's a byte stream. And anytime you see ones and zeros, you realize you have digital information, right? And the way a lot of these T lights work is they had a very simple transmission code where they would blast like 6,000 milliseconds and then no milliseconds and then 6,000 milliseconds or maybe microseconds is more appropriate here because it's not six seconds, it's like microseconds. And then they would burst a little pattern of like either 500 microseconds on or off. And with this library, you can actually make a little rig to still those codes. And then you can write just a little bit of code. This is all the code it needed to basically blast the same color over and over and over again with a little 50 millisecond pause in between so we don't wash out the TSOP. And here you can see the different pulses that make up the code. So I just sat there and stole the codes from the remote and then took my old badges, uh, put the programming on them, and then you can see the badge hanging off the brush. I was like, let's get a brush. And then there was a whole lot of testing that went on, which was how deep should that hole be? How far away should the puck be? How far away should the LED be? And what LED should it be? And I actually made an array. Because if I could read data sheets, I would know exactly what LED would probably work. <laughs> but you don't have to do that. You don't have to be an electrical engineering to approach this world. You can do it like a programmer if you wanted to. And the way a program would do it is trial and error. So I went to Mauser, and I had some parameters I knew. I knew that what my forward voltage probably should be. I knew what my uh, milliamp range would be. And I just bought 100 different kinds of IR LEDs. And I put them in my rig one at a time and ran them down this strip until I found one that worked really well. I said, that's the one. And this was the winner right here. And actually, um, for the electrical engineers who here are interested, the, uh, the, the um, chip that I'm using has a 50 milliamp uh, restriction, like uh, voltage current control. So it doesn't even hit the whole. So I'm basically underpowering this particular LED. And the result is it really felt like painting. Like, because that was what was important, is, it, is it, that it felt right. Not that the voltage is balanced or lined up, but that it felt like painting. And that was just trial and error. It had to be trial and error. So now I had my three basic components, an AT Tiny 45, which is really just a tiny, tiny Arduino, um, and then a CR 2025 and a 20 degree lens, 1.6 volt forward, forward voltage, 100 milliamp uh, infrared LED in a kind of a 2.5 millimeter form factor. All stuff I had no idea about when I started this. I just wanted to make a big light bright. One Google search at a time. One Google search at a time until it worked. By the way, this is a little like using a Ferrari to get the groceries. It's, um, 
because all I'm doing is pulsing <laughs> IRLI. You don't have one of these in your remote control at home unless like it's a, like a learning remote control or something. You can do this like so much uh, cheaper and effectively, but more components, and I knew how to use this guy. I like the idea. So now I went about miniaturization, because I was like, that's all really big. I don't want a thing. And um, so I changed the form factor to a surface-mounted chip, which meant I needed to get one of these, which is an AVR programmer through USB, which I read about in a Google article, and it made programming them a lot easier. And I needed one of these, which is an IC test clip, which allows you to grab onto that little tiny thing and then program it. And so I just took my Arduino sketch and started pushing it down in different colors to these little chip sets. And then I get confused which one was which, and I realized I needed a linear process where I did all yellow and then all blue because it's, I'm just not organized enough. And then I w went to EagleCAD. Actually, I went to Google and said, how do I make my own PCB? <laughs> and it said, buy another mill and then download the free version of EagleCAD and then go through a big tutorial to learn how to put together a very simple schematic and this is just a circuit, and then you can put together your own board. And that took me about a day and a half. I can do it a lot faster now, but it took me a day and a half to get, it's a steep learning curve, but once you get past it. And then this is my favorite thing in the world right now. It's my other mill. And the other mill is a five axis CNC that's bench top sized. And when you put a, a little tiny bit in it, you can make your own PCBs. And it does it pretty fast. And so I had a little factory going. And I now have made 250 different brushes and at a size. So once you get a PCB milled out this way, you can actually teach yourself to hot air solder and use surface mount components. And so there's something called solder paste. And you put it down with a magnifying glass. And then these are like 60 bucks on Amazon now. These used to be like. $600 bench tools, and then you sit there and you warm it up, and then you come in real close, and the flux in the solder all draws itself to the metal. And you don't have to be that accurate with it when you put it down. It just sucks, in, and it's so relaxing to do this. Like It's like pressure washing a deck. It's like in that category of relaxing. You're like, go, and then shh, it sucks up, and you're like, ooh. It's so cool. Pat. When you do it right, it'll literally move the chip into place, and it always seems like it's like put there perfectly every time. And so now I have my brushes. And I just zip tie them to the end of a brush. Um, you know, that's, this is the current draft. The next draft is working on a 3D printed clear handle where it fits on the inside with a capacitive strip so you can set your own color and um, little bristles that are um, uh, fiber optic, acrylic fiber optics to carry the IR face. That'll be the next version. But I ha I'm still doing a lot of Googling to get that done. <laughs> and I'm kind of stuck at the point of doing the 3D model. But I'll get through it eventually. And then you get your dad and your brother and you put the whole thing together. And it helps if your brother's a carpenter because he can build frames like this that are modular and he can build you crates like this, which fit it perfectly and are the size of a pallet. Um, and then you can bring it to FITC and set it up <clears throat> and watch people play with it. And as you guys know from playing with it, it seems like a very digital thing, and then it turns out to be a very analog experience. But it all just works because of this magic of infrared light being invisible, and, um, and I really like that. And then we, we, we all wrote a bunch of cool things on it. And then you make a little video with like strummy music. <laughs> It's crazy. That wall has been around the world now. <laughs> it's been up here. It's been going. It's going to go to Europe next summer for the whole summer. I don't know why. People like it. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of things. And now I am working on the social cups themselves, which would be really fun. Uh, those cups that glow and light up. Um, there's a couple ways I'm gonna, going to de deploy them. Uh, one, we're going to deploy them in a fundraiser where you buy your cup. 
and then you say what color you want it to be. And then we tell the cup how much you paid for it. And then you walk around the room, and if you are in the presence of someone who paid more for their cup than you paid, so you bought a cup and yours is blue, and you paid 50 bucks for it, it's a fundraiser. <laughs> and I paid 25 bucks for mine and it's green, and I walk up, I'm like, hey, how's it going? My cup turns blue. <laughs> Because you paid more for your cup. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, I'm not even getting the green cup that I... <clears throat> so I have to go back and pay more for my cup. So yours. <laughs> That's one way. And we're going to do that, not this May, but next May at the Think by Making party May in, in early May at Maker Fair Austin. The second way is that you would go up and say, like, oh, I, I am looking for funding. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm looking for funding. And you would walk around the room with your cup, and when you were in the presence of someone else, you're like, oh, I still write action script. Someone else says, I still write action script. And when you're in the pleasure of that, both your cups light up all of a sudden. I think there's just some really fun things. So I'm working on that next. Okay, interactive light. This is the other side of things. Um, we love our smartphones. And they become like an integral part of our life. We take them everywhere. We immerse in that. You guys have heard this speech before, have you? I love giving this speech, right? We have chosen digital immersion. Really? Right? And it's getting more immersive. This is creating a market. This is the short version. This is creating a market for augmented reality, right? which is going to solve all this, except for it's not, because you see this and everyone else sees this. <laughs> it's very personal computing. What we want is an integrated reality. We want our digital lifestyles to join us out in the real world, and this would give us certain values. One, we can mark up the physical world with all the digital data that we are used to having access to. Two, we could continue to be more heads up and present in our environment. No more walking into fountains while we text. Three, we could create cooperative computing, right? It's uh, two people can be working in the same interface, and it's something we're really hungry for in computing. Three, we can be highly contextual. So we had a clear LLED in a, in a <clears throat> car window. We could shop for houses simply by doing the drive-by. And the last one is because voice needs an asymmetrical UI. If you go look at the form follows me presentation, um, you'll see that we are entering a stage where a lot of interfaces are being done through voice. And voice is very good for making requests like this, but it breaks down at a point. And that point is when you're trying to do something useful, right? So if you ask Alexa what makes a good taco. Place the flank steak in a large plastic storage bag. In a small bowl, mix all of what? Right. That's not going to work too well. Uh, what you really need is just a recipe, right? How do you do that? Well, interactive light, right, at a new level. The interface is moving out in the open to satisfy these needs, and we start seeing more interfaces on horizontal surfaces. And how are they going to get there? Projectors. And the infrared of a Kinect camera. And the projectors might not look like this. They'll probably look like this. And they'll just screw into your light sockets. Or they'll look like this, and they'll go into gangs. And they'll do this. Any horizontal surface in a home or a room can be retrofitted as a computer display. And we've, I've shown videos like this throughout the years that included a lot of horizontal projection. And turn on the lights. This one was done at Frog. Turn off this light. And I'm going to skip, because you've all seen it, I hope, a million times. If not, go find it. It's great. When we started Argo Design, we wanted to do a chapter two. This was chapter two. It's called Smart Dumb Things. Moon, sailing over a cardboard sea. But it wouldn't be make-believe if you believed in me. Yes, it's only a canvas sky. Hanging over a muslin tree, but it wouldn't be made. So you get it. This is like the stuff of like concept videos everywhere. Uh, and if you're very astute, you also noted that uh, it wasn't real, that it was 
CG. And that's not very think by making, is it? <laughs> at all. So what we did next is like, you know what, let's take that concept video and let's make it. And then, and that's this project here, Interactive Life. I mentioned a little bit about this guy. That's Jarrett Webb, and he's taken all over a lot of the coding of this stuff for me over the years. And so, a lot of what we're going to see in the closing five minutes here is code that he wrote in Open Frameworks or in various other stacks using the Connect um, uh, uh, API and such. Let's go over these principles real quick. If you were reading along, you notice that. This is just the beginning, that when you start projecting light as an interface on sur surfaces, there's some important considerations, and one of them is fitment. It doesn't feel very nice when you project items on top of things. And so you have to find clear spaces on the desk and put things in those clear spaces. So this is now real. We're using the Connect to find open spaces algorithmically on the table, designate them, and this is kind of the windowing system of this, of this kind of o OS architecture. Um, the next one is participation. Sometimes you want interface to just be interface, but sometimes you have to be aware that you're allowed to touch it with a hand or certain other objects. And so the interface, because it's light, can actually participate in your environment. So here we're using the coffee mug as a dimmer. The handle's very useful <laughs> for it not being a pure round object. It's really hard to tell what direction pure round objects are going. Another principle is augmentation, right? what you put on there. You may notice that we're not using projection on horizontal surfaces to do slideshows or show movies, like the box of all projectors show. We're just using white light to put out the information, right? So here, I can go to the bar, and I don't have to sit there and wait while they serve more attractive people than me. I can just leave my beer behind, and the bartender knows what they do. This is the uberization of the bar, when you think about it. No more personal interaction needed. Uh, and then coordination. Eventually, you want everything to, you, you want the system to actually know what these items are and be able to give you the data for those items on the table, which is going to take a whole lot of machine learning and stuff to begin identifying more and more items. When you pair this with conversational computing, this is what we call interactive light. And this is like the shared multifunction interface of the future that I think is really coming. And to do it, you need a lot of calibration. Um, this is just an example of calibration. Notice all the levels and the strings and the grids. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this digitally, but the better calibration you have physically, the, the less you have to do digitally. And I found that these C stands and stuff just didn't work at all. They were too wiggly and wobbly. And so I actually went into my garage and designed my own stand here, um, which is designed to be placed up against objects or underneath objects, and it's kind of cantilevered. And this kind of a stand here. That kind of a stand can be fixed to a table. What's great about that is if the table wobbles, the projector wobbles, the connect wobbles, it all feels like a real interface. It feels like your iPad. When your iPad wobbles, the screen wobbles. When a stand and a table are separate and the table wobbles, your interface wobbles and you kind of stand back, it feels weird. Um, now we could get things down to like a much more precise level of calibration. We could also get them way up in the air, which meant we could use brighter projectors. The thing about ultra short throw is unless you have $30,000, you're kind of limited to 6,000 lumens. And uh, to get higher lumen projectors, you just got to go higher in the air to accommodate the throw. Um, and then we used it. We actually got some work off of the vision. We got to do a trade show at the United Rentals. 
You can see our projectors back there. It's that interface that you just saw the video about. And um, basically, like, this is your construction equipment. United Rentals rents equipment. And you're like, okay, I need this over at this um, uh, construction site, so I'll just move it over there, and presumably somewhere in the back. End. It was just a provocation to get them thinking about the future of things. And then we built, did a other couple of things where we could just move objects around and have them trigger events. And it was a really fun way, better than a, a, a PowerPoint, basically. So now we're just playing with this in a lot of different ways, uh, the simple interfaces. Right now, it's really helpful to give people objects. You can actually touch those circles, but nobody will. Uh, and then this guy came along. <laughs> and that guy is David Letterman. <laughs> and it was really cool, because he's a childhood hero of mine. And I got to, and he just kept saying, oh, wow, the kids these days, the things they're up to. <laughs> and he just thought it was really, really cool. Uh, by the way, this is important to all of us. Sony is pursuing this heavily. They just uh, announced their Future Lab T. It's a projector and a computer vision stand on a stand that's connected to a table. Clever, Sony, and they did a much better job designing it than I did. <laughs> and then the Xperia projector is another interactive projector. So time to get ready for it. If you're a graphic designer, we need a font that looks good when projected. Uh, Helvetic, you know, Times New Roman was for papers. Helvetic and Arial for the screen. And uh, now we need one for projection, so work on that. And if you're interested, just send me uh, some uh, uh, social media and we'll talk about the future of interactive light. Thank you very much.